everybody. Um, just a bit of background before I start. Um, I'm Bob Elliott. I'm a BSAC diver of many, many years standing. Uh, I'm also uh, an RWA Yacht Master instructor and I run a sea school at Portland in Dorset. Uh, welcome. Um, we're going to cover an introduction to charts this evening and it's the first uh, presentation of a two-part presentation that goes into quite a lot of detail on charts that is relevant to diving. Uh, so let's kick off with um, a, a few uh, objectives so that we know what we're going to achieve by the end of the session. So here are our objectives by the end of the session. So that will be after next week. Um, I'm hoping you will have some understanding of the following things. Understand many of the features of a chart, including the title stream box. Uh, Recognise and understand the meaning of at least a half a dozen chart symbols. Uh, be able to measure a distance on a chart, establish a position by latitude and longitude, and understand direction from the compass rings. Now, uh, in respect of those last three items there, so measuring a distance, establishing position by latitude and longitude, and understanding the compass rows, they're very relevant to what you do as divers in terms of using electronics to go out and find dive sites. Uh, most dive boats these days will have some sort of GPS or chart plotter on board. Um, and it's very easy to rely upon the information that uh, that device gives you without um, understanding the background to it and knowing whether that information is correct or not. So being able to take something from a chart, for example, a distance to the dive site or to the shipwreck that you want to uh, dive um, is very relevant because then you can check off against the chart plotter to know that it's actually giving you the correct information. Uh, when you put in a, a site on a chart plotter and you press the go to button, it gives you a, a, a variety of bits of information. And one of them is the distance to the site. Another is the direction to the site. So if you know it's four miles to the site, that's what your chart plotter should be telling you. Clearly, establishing a position by latitude and longitude is also important because when the Coast Guard say, well, uh, where are you? Um, that's one of the methods that you have of, uh, of uh, describing your position. And finally, um, checking that you're going in the right direction and understanding that the chart plotter is giving you the right direction to go in is also quite important. So there's not a lot of um, uh, change in terms of paper chart works because we're now using it as a check against our electronics. So those are the objectives. Um, as I said, this is a two part presentation. And in the first part of the presentation, I'm going to cover the legend. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. And I'm going to look at some of the coastal and sea features on a chart. Now, um, I hope that you guys have all got yourself an RWA chart number three. And if you have, this is what you should have in front of you at this moment. And here's a picture of RWA chart number three. We made it a prerequisite that you obtained one of these charts. Uh, in order to sit in on this presentation uh, because it's uh, a, a, a useful uh, feature to have a chart in front of you. So this is our way chart three. If you haven't got it in front of you, I'd like you to get it out now, fold it in half and set it on the table in front of you so that you can see this area of the chart. Uh, and this area of the chart is called the legend. So. I'll give you a second or two, guys. Get your charts out, put them on the, the, the table in front of you and have a look at this area of the chart. And that's where we're going to start. OK, um, well, the first thing I'm going to say about this particular chart is that it's an Admiralty chart. And if you look just by the RWA logo at the top here, just to the left of it is a, uh, an Admiralty logo. So this is an Admiralty chart produced by the Admiralty uh, for the RWA uh, for the day skipper course. And it's a totally fictitious chart. Now, there's lots of other people out there that are producing charts. Um, 
in red are a uh, very popular chart brand that you find uh, out in the marketplace. And this is a picture of an IMRE chart. IMRE charts are somewhat different to Avamorti charts in that they, first of all, use a different colour scheme. Avamorti chart has a colour scheme that's uh, this sort of yellow colour with uh, white for the sea, uh, green areas that dry out at low water, and two shades of blue for shallow water. Uh, but if you look at an IMRE chart, it's a completely different colour scheme. Um, uh, they use blue for the sea and green for the land and so on and so forth. Now, the reason for that quite simply is that uh, IMRE are a book company um, and they buy their data from the Admiralty to produce their charts. And their charts are made almost entirely for the sailing fraternity. The Admiralty won't let them use the same colour scheme uh, as an Admiralty chart because um, it's their colour scheme and it's trademarked. Um, so they have to produce their charts in a different colour. Uh, there are some other major differences between IMRE charts and Admiralty charts. Because IMRE charts are made for the sailing fraternity, what a sailor wants to do is to go on a passage. He wants to leave one particular uh, port and get into another port, and he gets his fun out of undertaking the passage. So if you've got a shipwreck on the seabed in 80 metres of water, that's not terribly relevant to that sailor because it's not a hazard to him uh, and he's never going to collide with it. It's far too deep. So IMRE delete from their charts information that's not relevant to passage making. That 80 metre shipwreck needn't be on the chart as far as IMRE are concerned. So they take away data that is not relevant to passage making but they do include things on their chart that are relevant. And most sailors will want to go somewhere, they want to go to a port. So IMRE include data on how to get into port. So you get these little pictures of um, the entrance to the port as part of the chart. And this particular one is, is of Limington and is showing you how to get into Limington. Now you don't get that on an Admiralty Martin. Admiralty charts are the most accurate charts that we have available, and they have the most data on them, but they can only be as good as the source information they have in the first place. What I'm going to do now is swap back to my PowerPoint presentation where I've got a blow up of the Admiralty chart. So what you should be able to see now is uh, the same chart that you have in front of you and the same chart as the picture that I've just been showing you on a camera. And the area that we are interested in is this area down at the bottom, uh, which is the area where the legend is. So let's blow that up so you can see it. And here it is here. Now, as I've already said, um, the uh, Admiralty use a particular Color scheme and their color scheme is such that the land is this horrible yellow color anything that dries at low tide is green and shallow water is two shades of blue so if you're going out in your boat avoid the green bits because at certain states of the tide they're going to be land uh, this area of the chart where the writing is is called the legend and uh, the Admiralty always put the legend on the land so as to not to obstruct the sea, which is where you're going to do your navigation. So that makes sense. So the legend could be anywhere on your chart where there's a bit of land. Uh, the colours that they choose are chosen for a particular purpose. They're chosen because they you can see them under a red light. And at night when you're navigating, um, you would have a red light on your chart table because red doesn't destroy your night vision, white does. You can see these colors under a red light, so you're able to navigate. Let's have a look at this legend, because the legend contains lots of useful information about the area that the chart covers. I've already said it's an Admiralty chart, and there's the Admiralty logo, and it's a training chart produced uh, for uh, the RWA by the Admiralty. 
And the first thing it says on this training chart is not to be used for navigation. Well, that's because it's entirely fictitious. And, you know, you can't use a fictitious chart for navigation. Uh, the ROA used to use a fictitious chart based upon the Devon coastline. Uh, and there were two fictitious islands off of Brixham. If any of you have ever been to Brixham, you will realise there are no islands off of Brixham. And uh, the RWA had to withdraw the chart when they found that people were trying to find these islands to go for lunch. Now, what's relevant to us is the colour that's been used uh, to say not to be used for navigation. That's a colour called magenta. And anything on an Admiralty chart that is in magenta is important. They use magenta to identify the important features that you need to take notice of. OK, moving on then. Then we've got a box of information. And um, clearly, the legend, this written information, will vary from chart to chart, depending upon the area that the chart is covering. First thing that it says in this box is that depths are in metres and are reduced to chart datum, which is approximately the level of the lowest astronomical tide. Let's put a bit of flesh on the bones of that. Uh, chart datum is a fictitious line that extends from a slot cut in the harbour wall at Newlyn in Cornwall and is the standard from which the depth of water is measured for the world. Now, how it became a standard for the world, I really have no idea. Uh, how we arrived at using a place in Cornwall called Newlyn as the standard from which we measure depths of water, I can answer. In 1915, we were fighting a war with Germany, and the main means of moving troops around was by ship. Prior to 1915, all of the ports around the UK used their own datums to measure the depth of water and they tended to exaggerate the amount of water they had available in their port to attract larger ships and therefore more money coming into the port. The result of that was that many of these ships simply ran aground trying to get into the port. The main means of transportation during the First World War was by ship and the British government couldn't have their ships running aground as they went across the channel to the French coast. So they decided that they needed some means of improving these measurements for the depth of water. So they did three things. They set up three tidal observatories, one at Liverpool, one at Sheerness on the Thames, and one at Newlyn in Cornwall. Uh, they rapidly discovered that Sheerness and uh, Liverpool didn't work very well because every time it rained, as they were on a river, it affected the level of the water. So they uh, ended up using Newlyn in Cornwall as the standard. And they built a little building on the jetty in Newlyn. It's still there to this day. If you go to Newlyn, you can see it. It's a red and white building and it's right next to the lighthouse. And they installed a tide gauge in that building and they employed two guys to sit watching that tide gauge 24 7 between 1915 and 1922 and to measure the depth of water at Newlyn every 15 minutes and from the information that they derived from that they did two things they came up with the lowest astronomical tide at which they set chart datum and they put a brass bolt in the wall of the harbour at Newland that defines that chart datum level. Uh, and they came up with the average height of high water and they put another brass bolt in the wall to define that. And they then used that to measure all the mountains in the UK and found that some of them were not as high as they thought they were in the first place. Now our chart datum line is a fictitious line that extends from that brass bolt in Newland. The seabed goes down so the measurements on our chart, so for instance, here it says 25 metres at the top of the, my chart here. The measurements on our chart are the measurements between the seabed and that datum line at that particular point. The height of tide is always above the datum line. So if it says 25 metres on the chart and at the time you go there, it's high water, 
and you have five meters of tide at high water, the total depth of water that your echo sounder will read will be 30 meters. So these figures that you have on your chart are minimum figures. Um, they're the shallowest it's ever likely to be at that point. It will be shallower on a couple of rare occasions, but by and large, it's the shallowest it's ever going to be. Heights are in meters. Uh, so if there's something on the land uh, that's conspicuous from the sea, you can use it as an aid to navigation. So towers, lighthouses, large buildings, anything that can be seen by the, on the sea uh, that you can identify on the chart can be used as an aid to navigation and you can work out where you are in respect of it. If it's got a height to it, that height is shown in meters and that height is measured from the surface of the water at mean high water springs. That's the average height of high water on springtime, not from the land. And the reason for that quite simply is we are in a boat and we go up and down with the tide. So there's no sense in measuring it from the land. We need to know how high the object is above our boat. If we know how high the object is above our boat, we can work out roughly how far we are away from it. Then goes on to say that underlying figures are drying heights. Now, anything on an amortization chart that dries out is green. So these areas here dry out at low tide. If they have a drying height, and if you look very carefully at the top of the chart here, here's a drying height, 2.7 with a little underline beneath it. That means it dries out 2.7 meters above chart datum. So if you went to that particular spot at low water, you would have 2.7 meters of land. If the tide is five meters at high water, it needs 2.7 meters of water to cover the drying height. And <clears throat> you have water above that. So 2.7 from five is 3.3. So if you had a five meter tide, you went to that spot, you'd only have 3.3 meters of water. That's a drying height. Uh, all other heights are above mean high water springs. So that's the height of objects on. Them. Then we've got so it says satellite derived positions, and I'm not going to go into that into too much detail because that's more relevant to chart plotters. Uh, but it does make a mention of something called WGS84. Uh, Mike, would you like to open their mic? So can somebody tell me what WGS84 is, please? World Geodetic System 1984. Okay, and why, and why is that relevant to us? Because um, every chart has a reference datum, and if the datum isn't the same as your instrument, then you can't plot the positions directly on the chart. Thank you, Simon. That was a brilliant answer. Well done. So if it says on your chart WGS84, it means it's totally compatible with the GPS system. And it stands for World Geodetic System, and 1984 is the year of the, the datum. Um, if it's uh, a WGS84 chart, it will have that information written on it in magenta uh, on the bottom and top of the chart. If you have any other uh, order charts that are in different datums, and there are lots and lots of datums out there, uh, the previous one to this was Ordnance Survey Great Britain 1936. So if you have charts that are in different datums, they will not be compatible with GPS unless you make some adjustment to them. And frequently that adjustment is shown upon the chart. Then we've got a bit that says navigational marks, IALA maritime voyage system. I'm not going to cover the voyage system at all uh, when I'm talking about this chart. So it's something that you need to look at at a later, uh, later stage. Then we've got projection Mercator. Uh, again, Mike, can you open their mics? Uh, can anybody tell me what that means? Mercator projection. It's how the uh, sphere of the world is projected onto a flat map. Okay, fantastic. Can you tell me any more? Uh, there's various methods of it. Um, I think there's only one method of Mercator. Let's make that quite clear. There's only one method of Mercator, but um, yep. there's various methods of projections. There and are indeed. Yeah. Okay. Mercator is one. 
It is. So not why is it relevant? Why is it relevant to us then, Nick? Um, because it's the one used on this map. Okay, and it's the one that's used on all coastal navigational charts. So it's the common one that we as divers come across all of the time. And um, Mercator was a person. And there he is. And his name was Gerardos Mercator. And he was a Dutchman and he worked in Germany. And his profession was globe maker. Uh, because before we had charts, everybody went around with globes on ships or pocket globes so that they could describe to their friends where, uh, where, where they had been. And navigation took place on those globes. And there was a need to take the curved surface of our planet and put it on a flat piece of paper. And in 1652, Gerardus Mercator was the first person to come up with um, a sensible projection that worked that allowed us to do that. Um, the great thing about that, as far as I'm concerned, is 450 years later or thereabouts, despite all the changes in technology that have taken place, certainly in the last 50 years or so, we still have nothing better. And almost all of our navigation, our coastal navigation, will take place on a Mercator projection chart. Now I'll come back to that and talk about that in a bit more detail in the second session. Uh, Mercator produced his first chart in 1652, and that's what it looked like. Uh, and for somebody that uh, clearly uh, worked in a hovel, uh, used candlelight to see what he was doing, had no running water, um, no electricity, a computer, what's a computer? To produce something like this in 1652, I think is quite remarkable. Now, uh, Gerardus Mercator did us a great favour with the production of Mercator projections. Let me just jump back to uh, a picture of a chart again. So there's our ROA training chart number three again. And some of the benefits of the way in which Mercator produced his projection are the following. Firstly, there are some lines up and down the chart which are called meridians of longitude. Here they are here. This is a meridian of longitude. And on Mercator projection charts, those meridians of longitude simply go up and down the chart. They're just parallel with one another. There's one there. Uh, here's another one here, and so on and so forth. They do not converge at the top and the bottom uh, in the way that they would if you took them from a globe. So that's the first issue. Uh, the second issue is Mercator made north at the top of his chart. So anywhere at the top of this chart is north, anywhere at the bottom of the chart is south, and east and west are on the sides. And because of the way in which the projection is produced, if you draw a straight line across a chart, uh, then it is indeed a straight line on the Mercator projection chart. And you can tell it's a straight line because it crosses every meridian and every parallel at the same angle. Now that's absolutely great uh, because GPS navigates in straight lines. So 450 odd years ago, this chap produced a projection that is totally compatible with GPS navigation. Wasn't aware of that fact, GPS hadn't been invented, but that is what we have with the Mercator projection chart. So that's a really beneficial to us. I'm gonna jump back to the presentation now, so just stand by. Okay, so there's Gerardos Mercator's first attempt to chart. Now, Mercator projection charts are charts that are used for coastal navigation. When we start navigating over uh, great distances over the surface of our planet, we don't go in straight lines. We can draw a straight line on a Mercator projection chart, we can follow that straight line. So that works very well for us. But when we're going across the Atlantic, for instance, to America, we don't go in a straight line. We go in a curve because we're going across the curved surface of our planet. So we need a different type of chart for long distance navigation. 
And it's exactly the same whether you fly across the Atlantic or go across on a, a vessel. If you fly across, you go up towards Iceland in the aeroplane, you come down the other side. Uh, but Cato projection charts don't allow that. So if we're going to get travel for great distances, we need a different type of chart. We need a mnemonic chart. And a mnemonic chart is a chart where the meridians of longitude, these straight lines here, converge at the top. But the parallels of latitude that um, are different on the Cato chart uh, are the same on this chart. And if you draw a straight line and get across a mnemonic chart, and here's our straight line, as you can see, it crosses each meridian at a different angle. And the result of that is it is not a straight line, it's actually a curve. And it's far easier to draw a straight line on a mnemonic chart and follow that straight line which takes you in a curve than it is to try and plot a curve on uh, uh, any other projection that you have available. So mnemonic charts, we're not going to use for coastal navigation, they're going to be for long distance passages. All right, let's move on with this legend. And the next thing we've got in this legend is sources. And this is simply where they got the data from, the Admiralty, to produce the chart. Now, clearly, um, there will be Admiralty charts available for all different parts of the world. Um, I've done work in the Philippines and we've used Admiralty charts. Um, I've done work all over the Mediterranean and we use Admiralty charts. When they're producing an Admiralty chart for a different part of the world, they're often reliant upon uh, information provided to them by the local people in those areas. So the chart can only be as good as that source information in the first place. Um, when we were doing some work in the South China Sea, uh, off of the Philippines, there was an area marked off on the chart uh, in magenta. It boxed off this certain area in the chart. And there was a note in there in magenta that said, don't go into this area at all uh, with your boat, because the data that was used to uh, produce this area is more than 200 years old. Now, 200 years ago, how would they have measured the depth of water? Uh, Mike, would you like to open people's mics up and we can get an answer to that? 200 years ago, how would they have measured the depth of water? Yeah, you'd uh, drop a weight down there and um, on a on a kind of oh, line right. with probably a bit of string with some knots in it. Um, yeah, on a bit of string. Was it, now, is that a particularly accurate way of doing it, Mike? Well, <clears throat> most charts, um, the depth is recorded that way, even even around the UK. Um, it's it's not. Uh, you, 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 there's going to be a bit. Of, there's going to be tolerance on that, depending on the drift of um, um, any tides dragging the uh, dragging the dragging the uh, the weight that you've got uh, hanging off the end of it. So, Mike, will we will we conclude that it's not going to be a particularly accurate method of doing it? Yeah, you're going to be plus or minus ten fathoms. Or so, <laughs> Mike, how much is a fathom? Um, it's about 20 meters. Uh, no, it's 20 feet. 20, or 22 feet, I think it is. No, 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 no. 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 Fathom is six feet. Six feet, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> right, now you're quite right. Originally, most surveying would have been done with a bit of string and a piece of weight. So no issues with that at all. But of course, um, the hydrographic office have a couple of um, survey vessels that are going around all the time. And an awful lot of surveying is taken out. Uh, awful lot of surveying is done these days with with echo sounders and, and sounders of one description or another. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Moving on then. Next thing we've got here is um, a set of notes in magenta, um, which clearly means they're important. I'm not going to read them out, but they're relevant to this particular chart, and there will be different notes on other charts. Uh, these cover pipelines, ferries, high speed craft, traffic separation schemes, that sort of thing. Uh, have a look at the particular chart that you're using when you go somewhere different. There will be different notes on. All right, what have we got next? Well, at the top of the chart, we've got this rather complicated looking 
uh, box and it's called a tidal stream box uh, and i've got a blow up of it here and a tidal stream box gives us information uh, on what the tide is doing at various places dotted around the chart and they're called tidal diamonds and if you look in the middle of your chart uh, south of uh, namley you'll find tidal diamond a and the information that we get in this tidal stream box uh, is based upon high water and in the box that relates to a it gives us a period of six hours before high water to six hours after high water and for each of those hours it tells us the speed of flow on a spring tide speed of flow on a neap tide uh, and the uh, direction of flow as a true bearing so we can use this information uh, to calculate what the tide is doing at these various places dotted around the chart and that's useful to us from a passage planning perspective but also from a diving perspective, one of the things that we want to know all the time is when slight more for it. So we go and dive whatever site that we want to want to dive. And common sense would suggest that slack water occurred at the same time as high water and low water, because as the tide comes in, it reaches a peak. It stops at that peak and. Um, that's when slack water occurs and then it goes out until it's at its lowest level and it stops flowing and turns around at that lowest level and that's when the second slack water occurs uh, but the best laid plans of mice and men that's not uh, always true uh, slack water does indeed occur at about the same time as high water and uh, low water where you have straight sided areas of land with no obstructions that upset the flow of the tide where you've got complicated land masses like the channel islands where there are lots of islands that the water runs around like portland bill that sticks out into the main tidal flow and obstructs the tide and like many other places in the scottish islands for instance where you've got complicated bits of land that affects the uh, flow of the tide and affects slack water uh, let's define slack water as the uh, slowest flow or a maximum change in direction. So here on tidal diamond A, at four hours before high water, we've got a, a major change of direction from 108 to 26 to 297. And the flow is gone from a knot down to 0.4 of a knot and back up to 1.4. So slack water on this particular uh, tidal stream box tidal diamond day occurs about four hours before high water and again um, the, we get two tides a day we get two high waters and two low waters we also get two slack waters a day and the second slack water occurs at about an hour after high water where again there's a major change in direction 271 170 111 and minimum flow on springtime from 1.1 knots down to half a knot and back up to 1.6 knots. So on tidal diamond day, slack water is about four hours before high water and about an hour after. Now, however, uh, this data for four hours before and one hour after, the tide is given to us in hourly lumps. And this information begins four and a half hours before high water and finishes three and a half hours before high water. And this information here at plus one begins a half an hour after high water and goes to an hour and a half after high water. So it's an hour of tide in each case. It starts a half an hour before it goes to half an hour after and the minus four and the plus one is the mid middle of that hour of time so is that where the rule of twelfths comes in no rule of twelfths is to do with depth of water rather than speed of flow and direction and is somehow completely different but whoever mentioned british summertime that's very relevant because of course during british summertime um, our tide tables are given to us in UT, universal time, which is the same as GMT. 
and we need to add an hour to the times in the time tables to convert to British summer time. Okay, now what we haven't said is where is this high water coming from? And obviously, in order to determine uh, how these tidal uh, stream pictures work, we need to know the time of high water. And for that, we need to consult a set of tide tables. So here's a picture of a set of tide tables. Um, and if we look at the sixth, for instance, and let's just highlight that there, there's the sixth there. That's the area, the area we're looking at on this occasion. It was a Sunday, a good diving day. Um, 0133.4 of a meter was low water. 0847, two meters was high water. There's the next low water, and there's the next high water. And if you notice, this area is a shaded area. If you look at a set of tide tables in a nautical almanac, in this case, this is a fictitious almanac, but that's irrelevant. The principle is exactly the same. It says on the top of your tide tables that uh, for British summertime, add one hour in the non shaded area. So this shaded area on the right is UTC, Universal Universal Time Constant, or GMT. And the non shaded area is the white area on the left hand side, which is British summertime. So, if we were to take the fifth, uh, the time of high water on the fifth would not be 747. We'd have to add an hour to that to make it 847. So, we get our high water times from a set of tide tables. And the set of tide tables are, that we need to use are determined on the top of the tidal stream box. And I'll show you something on that in a moment. The other thing we need to know to make these tidal diamonds work is whether it's a spring tide or a neap tide. And spring tides in the tidal diamonds are shown in red, and neap tides are shown in blue. Now, spring tides and neap tides don't just occur on one individual day. Uh, from a neap tide, the tide builds up until it reaches a spring and it dies away again until it goes down to a neap. And a rule of thumb method to, to decide whether it's a spring tide or a neap tide is very, very simple. Uh, it's said to be a spring tide starting two days before the red day and completing two days after the red day. And neap tides start two days before the blue day and complete two days after the blue day. And then anything in the middle, so there's a start of our neat tide there on the seventh. Anything in the middle, in this case the sixth, is deemed to be a mid tide because it's part way between a spring and a neap. And when we look at our tidal stream uh, box uh, for the relevant tidal diamond, what we're going to do is add the speed flow, speed of flow on the spring tide and the speed of flow on the neap tide together. And divide by two to come up with halfway between the two. That's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, uh, let's just have a little example of that. And I've got here now a picture of uh, Weymouth in Portland. Uh, and um, I've chosen a shipwreck here out in the middle, and it happens to be the M2. And the nearest tidal diamond to the M2 is tidal diamond B. Now, we need to know what tides to use to work out what's happening on tidal diamond B. And uh, to establish that, we need to look at the tidal stream boxes on the uh, Weymouth and Portland chart. So let me just swap back to a camera a moment for you guys. Okay, and here's the Weymouth and Portland chart. And here's the tidal stream box. And if you look very, very carefully, you ought to be able to read what it says on the top of that box. And it says Plymouth. So the Portland chart, there's the Portland chart, is using Plymouth as a standard port to work out what the tides are doing at Portland. 
Uh, Mick, if you'd like to unmute their mics for a moment. Um, why are we using Plymouth, gentlemen and ladies, to work out what's going on at Portland? Why are we using Plymouth to work out what's going on at Portland? Not the nearest standard port. Okay, but why Plymouth? Massive naval port. Ah, and who made the chart, Karen? Admiralty. There you go. So when they invented the system, they simply chose to base tidal stream information on their major naval ports. Um, the next one up from us is Portsmouth. Then we have Dover and so on and so forth. Um, so the fact that Plymouth is 150 miles away from Portland is completely irrelevant because everything has been adjusted to take that into account. And clearly, high water occurs at Plymouth before it does at Portland because the tide comes uh, from the Atlantic. The main flow flows up the English Channel from the Atlantic towards Dover. And clearly, uh, the uh, bulge of water that is the tide gets to Plymouth before it gets to Portland. Uh, leave their mics open, please, Mick. Anybody know? what the time difference is for the time of high water between Plymouth and Portland. Is it one hour? Who said that, please? Say again, please. John Kelly. Hello, uh, John Kelly. I think it was an hour, I think it is, isn't it? John, you're pretty good. It's 50 minutes. Yeah. Yeah? So the time, the time of high water at Plymouth is about 50 minutes earlier than it is at Portland. And we don't know any of that. Turn their mics off, Mick, again, please. We don't need to know any of that. All we need to know is the time of high water at Plymouth and then look at our tidal stream uh, boxes for the appropriate tidal diamond. And in this particular case, for diving the M2, we want tidal diamond B. So let's just have a little look at the correct tidal stream box for tidal diamond B. And here it is here. Uh, and what I'd like you to do, Mick, if you un, uh, uh, un, unmute their mics, when is slack water on the M2 on tidal diamond B, please, ladies and gentlemen? Looking about plus five hours is the best time. Plus five hours is the best time. So here? Yeah? Yep. Plus five hours, and how about before high water? Two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Two hours before. Okay, fantastic. So, high water on the M2 using tidal diamond B starts two and a half hours before high water, and completes an hour and a half before high water, and starts four and a half hours after high water, and completes five and a half hours after high water. So that's nice and easy, isn't it? And that high water is high water Plymouth. So if high water Plymouth was at 12 o'clock, two and a half hours before 12 o'clock is half past nine in the morning. So Slack's going to start at half past nine and it's going to complete about half past 10. Uh, and if Slack is at 12 o'clock, it's going to start four and a half hours after 12 o'clock, which is half past four in the afternoon and complete at half past five in the afternoon. Hope everybody's okay with that. Okay, so that's a bit about slack water. Now, next little thing I've got um, is to pick out a few uh, symbols and abbreviations on uh, the uh, chart that you have in front of you. And there are a multitude of symbols and abbreviations on an Admiralty chart, and you can't be expected to know them all, but I've picked out just a few. And I've started off by looking at uh, this place here called Farlow. And uh, Farlow is this area here. And I've highlighted this bit of Farlow. And if you look carefully, you'll see that in the water off of the point are all these sort of squiggly lines. Um, open their mics up, please. Mick, anybody tell me what these squiggly lines represent? The falls. I'm um, saying again, please, um, Andy. I think and, they're not contours. I, I'm sorry, they're not contours, Andy. Anybody else? The falls. Overfalls. Yes, they're overfalls. They're rough water. So they're a, a place where two tides meet. 
uh, and create rough water. Now, it may be because those two tides are in opposition to one another, or it might be because the water is flowing over a shallow area. But clearly, it's somewhere to avoid in your boat. And for those of you that know you know Portland, you'll know that there is a race off the end of Portland um, that uh, is exactly that. And um, if you looked at the Portland chart, you'll find these squiggly lines on the Portland chart to indicate that. Uh, then up here, I've got um, WKS, two dotted circles, 21 and a little line underneath. Uh, Mick, if you'd like to open the mic, somebody would like to have a go at that and see if they can tell me what that means. Right, 21 metres deep, that's been wire swept. Fine, well done. So that's the clearance to the top of the deck. So the minimum depth to the top of the wreck is 21 metres. What's wire sweeping? Two vessels pulling a chain or a wire across the top of the wreck reducing anything that's stuck up fantastic thank you very much indeed well done andy warren okay uh, moving on then um i've then got uh, an area here where we've got more squiggly lines and then down here in this corner here if you look at your chart very carefully right by tidal diamond r uh, there's some writing on the chart and it says f dot s dot m dot b k s h anybody help me with that you want to do their bikes Mick, please s h probably means shell doesn't it fine sand shale and fine sand f s fine sand m mud mud okay and broken shell so it's been the yeah. nature of the seabed now that's really relevant if you want to go diving um, you know, it'd be nice if we're diving on a nice rocky area. So it'll say R on the chart for rock. Um, you know, if we want some scallops, well, then they're likely to be on the sand uh, or on a muddy bottom. So um, that's useful to us. And of course, it's also useful if we're going to anchor as well. Now, there are any number of symbols and abbreviations on here. Uh, here is a traffic separation scheme, a motorway for large vessels with. Um, the ship's going in one direction uh, on one side of the uh, central reservation and in the opposite direction on the other side of the central reservation. So lots and lots of symbols and abbreviations on here. Um, you can't be expected to know them all. Uh, so there is a very good book called the Admiralty Symbols and Abbreviation Book. There it is there. It's called Chart 5011. So it's a chart in its own right, comes out of exactly the same set of offices that produce the Admiralty charts. And if you flick through that, there's a whole range of different symbols and abbreviations uh, that are uh, found on an Admiralty chart. So if you're not certain about something, you at least have an index that you could use to um, check on it and find out what it's about. So. That was our first presentation on an introduction to charts, and that was part one. And in part one, the idea was that we had a look at the legend, that's the written area of the chart, that gives us useful information about the area that the chart covers. It's going to vary from chart to chart because obviously the area changes from chart to chart. The legend's always on the land so that it doesn't obstruct the white area of the chart which is the main sea area where you're going to use uh, the white area for navigation i've then gone on to look at some of the coastal and sea features and i've included in that the tidal stream box and um, we've worked out roughly how we can uh, work out slack water we need the use of a tidal stream box tidal diamonds and a set of tide tables uh, those type tables are based on a standard port which is frequently nowhere near where we actually are and it's always listed on the top of the uh on the tidal stream box and then there's a whole host of coastal and sea features i've picked out just a couple on your chart have a good look around the chart that you've got uh, for other things that are on so good evening everybody uh welcome to uh, the second part of the introduction to charts 
And there are going to be a few things that you need this evening, but let's start off by looking at what we've covered and what we're going to cover this evening. So I'm on a PowerPoint presentation. I hope that everybody can see it. It's a picture of a chart. It says an introduction to charts. And here are um, our objectives for this evening. Uh, by the end of the session, I'd like you to be able to uh, take a position in latitude and longitude from a chart so that you can put it into your chart plotter presumably go to a site, could be a shipwreck, could be a reef, uh, and use the compass rows to determine uh, direction. Along with latitude and longitude, we need to be able to measure distances as well. We're going to use latitude and longitude for that. We've already covered uh, a range of things on uh, the chart. I hope you've all got the RYA chart that we asked you to buy. Things that we've covered were uh, the features of a chart, some of the symbols and abbreviations. I'm now going to swap to a, a little bit of video and I'll show you the things that you're going to need for this evening's session. So bear with me for a second or two. And what you should all now be seeing is a picture of RYA chart three. And I'd like you to prepare your chart so that you can see this particular area. Um, here's a, a, a traffic separation scheme here in the centre, and this is the, the bottom half of the top of the chart. And the area I'm interested in to start with tonight is this area here. It would be nice if some of you had a Portland chart plotter. If you don't, it's not a disaster at all, uh, but it would be useful to have just an A4 sheet of paper, paper instead of a Portland chart plotter. And I'll show you what we're going to use that for a bit later. Uh, similarly, so if any of you have dividers, uh, they will be extremely useful. But again, we can get around that if you don't. So if you could prepare your chart so that you have this particular area of the chart showing, that would be really good. OK, now we uh, spoke during the last session about Mercator projection charts and I introduced you to a gentleman called Gerardos Mercator. Um, I did feed you a little bit of a bum steer because I told you that Gerardos Mercator invented the chart in, in uh, 1562 uh, and actually it was 1569 so I hope you'll give me the seven year difference uh, with the mistake that I made. Gerardos Mercator produced the first chart by taking the curved surface of our planet and putting it on a flat piece of paper. And if you remember from the previous session, um, he was a globe maker and he was a Dutchman and he worked in Germany. And what I'd like to do now is have a look at the problem that um, the navigators of that day had when they wanted to plan a passage and go somewhere. Now, prior to Mercator producing a chart, everybody went around using a globe and they had pocket globes somewhat like this uh, so that they could show their uh, friends where they had been. And on the ship, they had a much larger version of it, which they used for navigation. And you can see if you look very carefully at this pocket globe, the meridians of longitude, which are these big circles that go around the planet through the North and the South Pole. You can also see the parallels of latitude, which are uh, the uh, big circles that uh, go around the center of the planet in the opposite direction and extend between the equator and the North Pole and the equator and the South Pole. And Gerardus Mercator, a globe maker, this was the sort of thing that he made in his day <clears throat> out of paper mache. Now, there were some problems associated with using a globe. The first thing was that you needed a curved ruler of some description to fit the shape of the globe. So that made things a bit difficult. Um, the second problem was that if you draw a straight line across a globe, it's not actually a straight line, it's a curve. Uh, and um, also there were additional uh, complications in that although navigators at the time could establish their uh, latitude, that's how far north or south of the equator they are, they were unable to establish the longitude. And it wasn't until uh, the mid uh, 1800s that they were able to establish longitude. <clears throat> so 
nobody had a chart and various people were trying to produce flat pieces of flat pieces of paper charts and Mercator was just one of many um, in this country um, the academics at the Royal Observatory at Greenwich were also trying to do exactly the same task and Paraban Mercator actually beat them to it now I don't know if you can see but if you look very carefully you should be able to see on um, a globe the parallels of latitude that extend from the equator to the North Pole and from the equator to the South Pole are equal spaced and you can actually see the gaps between them are equal from the equator to North Pole. That creates a problem when we start to come to take this curved surface and put it onto a flat piece of paper. And the traditional way of opening up a globe is rather um, like the segments of an orange. And if you look at this globe, you can see that um, these lines here all converge at the North Pole. And if you took them out of the globe, they would be like the segments of an orange. So let's see what Mercator did to take this curved surface and put it on a flat piece of paper. And I'm going to use an example, the island of Iceland. And here's Iceland at the top of the world. And Iceland's just a, a tiny little round island. And of course, most of the distortion when you open this globe up takes place at the north and the south. There's very little distortion around the middle. Let's swap back to our PowerPoint presentation and see what Mercator did. OK. What I've got here is a picture of the segments uh, taken from that globe. And uh, each of these uh, lines represents a meridian of longitude. Uh, and as you've opened them out from the globe, they've come apart at the top and they've come apart at the bottom, but they've remained together around the equator, around the center. And this meridian is exactly the same line as this one here except we've sort of split it in two so you can see from the picture i've got in front of me that most of the uh, confusion most of the problems are associated near the poles that you get what mercator did was he said well on my projection i'm going to make some changes and the first thing i'm going to do on my projection projection is i'm going to make the uh meridians of longitude straight and parallel so here's our little picture of iceland here and as we've drawn this at this moment in time we can end up with a bit of iceland on one side of this gap and a bit of iceland on the other side of the gap and um, a, a gap which is totally fictitious and across which navigation is is impossible so iceland currently looks a bit like that now, if you make the meridians of longitude straight and parallel, and there they are there, that has the effect of joining Iceland together, but now it's a sausage. So it's completely in the long shape. If you remember, it's a little round island at the top of the world, uh, and the shape has got to be right. So Mick, if you'd like to uh, open their mics up for a moment or two, a question, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm assuming we've got a few ladies with us this evening, so good evening, ladies. A question, what are we going to do to this shape to get it back to this shape, but at a larger size? The question is, what are we going to do to this shape to get it back to this shape, but at a larger size? Can somebody come back to me with an answer on that, please? Yeah, yeah. change the um, uh, change the long latitudes, make them bigger at the top. Make them bigger at the top. OK, um, that's the technical answer. I, um, I, I, I don't know who came back with it, that technical answer. Stick, stick with me. Who are you? Giles Adams. Hello, Giles. OK, that's the technical answer. In simplistic terms, blue, blue sky thinking, what yeah. have I got to do to that shape to get it back to that shape? But stretch, it up, stretch it up and down. I've got to stretch it. OK, so what I've actually got to do is to stretch it in this plane. Are we agreed, Giles? Yeah. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Yeah. OK, so our man Mercator has done uh, one thing already on his projection. He's made the, the meridians of longitude straight and parallel. And if you look at your 
chart that you have in front of you, you can see those meridians uh, going from the bottom to the top of the chart. They don't converge at the top and bottom. They're straight in parallel with one another. And to stretch this shape in this plane, to get it back to that particular shape there, uh, our man Mercator came up with a solution to that as well. And his solution, very simple solution, was to make the parallels of latitude, the big circles that go around our planet parallel to the equator, wider apart as we go north and south from the equator. And you can see from the example I've got here that they expand as they go north and south. Now, the gap between them represents the same distance on the surface of our planet on a Mercator projection chart. But the effect of uh, stretching them farther apart as we go north and south is to stretch the picture we've got of Iceland in that particular plane and to get it back to the right shape, but at a larger size. Now, that's not a significant problem because as long as it's the right shape, we can navigate around it. If it's the wrong shape, it's impossible to navigate around it. As long as it's the right shape, we navigate around it. All we need to do is change the scale as we go north and south from the equator. North from the equator to the North Pole, and south from the equator to the, uh, the South Pole. Um, the result of that is that we end up with a picture of Iceland that is much, much larger than it actually is on a Mercator projection. Um, and indeed, all of the land masses nearer to the poles are, are stretched into larger sizes. But as long as it's the right shape, we can navigate around it. Now, to give you an example of that, for instance, uh, Greenland on a Mercator projection uh, chart is uh, presented as being roughly about the same size as Africa, uh, when in fact Africa's uh, surface area is approximately 13 times that of Greenland. So. Africa is 13 times bigger than Greenland, but because of this stretching that's taking place on a Mercator projection chart, um, they're, they, they look roughly the same size. That doesn't matter as long as we've changed the scale. Now, what scale are we talking about? Well, the scale that we're talking about is this scale here, and this is our uh, Mercator scaling. And um, I've got various examples of Mercator scaling here. Uh, in fact, there are four of them, one, two, three, four. And you can always tell a Mercator projection chart by looking at the latitude scale on the sides of the chart, because the Mercator projection chart has a segment that contains a black line. You can see a black line in this segment here. And then the next segment is clear. And then um, the following segment has a black line in it. So all alternate segments have a black line in them. And you can see that in all of these first four scales. Now, the size of the segments change as we go north from the equator to the North Pole and south from the equator to the South Pole. So whenever you're working on a Mercator projection chart, you need to measure distance in the area in which you are working. How do we do that? Well, it's simple. Uh, a minute of latitude equates to a nautical mile. You can see I've shown that here on the chart. So this is a minute of latitude, and a minute of latitude is a nautical mile. And the latitude and longitude scale, and the latitude scale is the scale on the sides of the charts, the longitude scale is the scale on the top and the bottom. Uh, latitude and longitude scale are split up into degrees, minutes, and tenths of a minute. And there are 60 minutes in every degree. And in each minute, the smallest segment you have is a tenth of a minute. And if you look at this uh, scale on the right here, you can see there are 10 little segments. Now, nautical mile in meters, we discovered last time was 1852 meters. So 1852 meters is that distance there, and a tenth of a nautical mile, therefore, is a tenth of that. 
which is 185 meters. So each of these little segments represents 185 meters. Uh, Mick, open their mics again for me, please. Uh, now, those of you that have got RYA chart three in front of you, this fictitious chart that I've asked you to buy, just have a look at the latitude scale on the side of the chart for me, please. And tell me the size of the smallest segment that you have in a minute of latitude. So what's the smallest segment you have on RYA chart three, this fictitious chart that I've been using? Um, I'm, I'll put it up so that you can see it. So we'll just swap back to it again for a moment. There it is there. There's our way a chart three. And if you look at the side of the chart, you can see minutes of latitude. And I've marked them here clearly. So what's the smallest segment we have in a minute of latitude, please? Somebody like to answer me? About a fifth of a nautical mile. A fifth of a nautical mile. So point two of a nautical mile. Yes, Giles, point two of a nautical mile. Whoever said it was a fifth of a nautical mile. Point two, are we agreed? So yeah, each, that's each, little, yeah, each of these little segments is two tenths of a nautical mile. Now that's just down to the general scale of this particular chart. So two tenths of a nautical mile in this particular case. It's going to be twice 185 meters, so about 370 meters. So the smallest segment on this particular chart is uh, 370 meters. Now, on a real chart, if we have a, a quick look at the chart of Weymouth and Portland, here's the real chart. The smallest segment on a real chart is usually one tenth. You can see the small segments here, 10 little segments, so one tenth. Now we have a further complication with this, and our further complication is that as we change the general scale of the chart, the size of the segment that represents a minute of latitude also changes. So the chart of Weymouth and Portland is 1 to 75,000. That covers about 20 miles of coastline from Portland Bill over on the left hand side here. You just see it here to St Albans Head. And uh, with that one to 75,000 scale, you can see that the size of a minute is one of these segments here, about two and a half centimetres, about an inch in size. But if we look at a, uh, a, a different scale chart, so here's a chart, this is a scale of one to 30,000. Our minute of latitude is now from here to here. So that's a huge segment, but it's still a minute of latitude and therefore it's still a nautical mile. And that minute of latitude is still split up into 10 little segments, each of which being a tenth of a nautical mile. Um, small distances in a nautical almanac, you have a silk cut nautical almanac, which is a useful document for uh, any form of navigation because it's uh, the Bible of the sea. All small distances in the nautical almanac are given in cables. And a cable is a tenth of a nautical mile. So if it says it's two cables to the harbour entrance, it's two tenths of a nautical mile to the harbour entrance. So don't make a mistake when you change the scale of the chart with the size of the minute because it's going to change as the scale of the chart changes. And you can see the minute here is that amount there. A minute on our Weymouth important chart is a much smaller amount, this little amount just here. OK. Now, um, as well as using the latitude and longitude scale to Come up with a, a position so that we tell people where we are. We're going to use the latitude scale to measure distance. So let's go back to uh, our way chart three. And uh, what I'm going to do is give you an example of how to measure a distance. And then we'll see if you guys that have got the chart, don't know how many of you've got it, uh, can actually replicate that for me. And I want to know how far it is from Cape Borshaw Lighthouse, just here to the lighthouse on Guillemot Island, just here. So that's the distance I want to measure. 
Now, clearly, if you have a pair of dividers, it's very simple to put your dividers across the uh, distance that we want. And then we need to take those dividers to the side of the chart adjacent to where we are working to get the most accurate measurement. Because remember, the scale on the side of the chart, the latitude scale, changes as we go north and south from the equation. If we then transfer that to the side of the chart, we can read the distance off against the scale. If you haven't got a pair of dividers, not a disaster, get a piece of A4 paper and simply mark the two places on the side of your A4 paper. So there's the distance we want. And then we can take that distance to the scale on the side of the chart and we can read it off. And I make it one, two, three, four, five, six nautical miles. Everybody okay with that? I hope that you are. Now, um, I've done that as an example for you. So let's see how you guys got on. For those of you that have got our way HR3, um, what I'd like you to do is find the upper set in the chart. Um, this is Northern Territories here. And there's uh, a lighthouse here on St. Anthony's Head. It says St. Anthony's Head Lighthouse. And up in the top left hand corner of your chart just here is a gas platform called Arthur Juliet Delta gas platform. And I'm going to draw a straight line between the two. And I want you guys to work out for me the distance between gas platform and the lighthouse. So that's the appropriate distance that we're looking for. So uh, Mick, if you could un uh, mask their mics for me. Uh, can somebody uh, on their chart work out the distance between the gas platform and the lighthouse and tell me how much they think it is big? Let's have two or three answers and we'll see how you get on, guys. So over to you. Yeah, that's nine and a quarter inches. You want it in miles? I like it in miles and, and right. tenths of miles. 33. Yeah, about 13, 13 and a half. 13 and a half, Paul McCallan is, is offering. Martin Peak, what do you think? 13.3. 13.3, Paul McCallum. Getting there, hang on. <laughs> okay. 13.2. 13.2, clearly. 13.2. 13.2, 13.3. Clearly, you need to take this measurement and transfer it to the side of the chart closest to where you are working to get the most accurate measurement. So I've got 13.2, 13.3, 13.5. Any other offers? 13.2. 13.2. Okay. 13.4. Fantastic. So you're all in the right sort of ballpark. So um, leave their mics open, Mick. Um, how many of you, you, your clubs, have club dive boats? Uh, yes, we do. Yeah. Do some of the clubs yeah. out there? Club, club ribs? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yes, yes. Stuff. All right. Um, Vivian, what sort of club rib does your boat have? Or does your club have? What sort of rib does it have? Humber. Good. Uh, how fast does it cruise? What's its cruising speed, Vivian? Uh, it's, it'll do about 20 knots. Like about 20 that. knots. Okay. So if your rib does 20 knots when it's cruising and you want to travel 13 miles, so we'll round it down to 13 miles, how long is it going to take you? Uh, you want to travel 13 miles and you've got a boat that does 20 nautical miles per hour. 13, 20. <laughs> you've got a boat that does 20 nautical miles per hour and you want to travel 13 miles. 39 minutes. 39 minutes. Who said 39 minutes? We did. Vivian. Vivian, okay. And how did you work that out, Vivian? Yeah. Things divided by 20 times by 13. Fantastic. Okay, so I've got a pad in front of me now. So the equation is 60 minutes in an hour divided by the speed of the boat times the distance to the site. So there's the equation. So if you can measure a distance from your chart to the dive site, 
no matter where that dive site is. Uh, Mick, you can turn the mics off for a moment now, please. If you can get the distance to the dive site, no matter how far that dive site is, and you know the typical cruising speed of your boat, it's very, very simple to work out approximately how long it's going to take you. And in this particular uh, example, our boat speed was 20 nautical miles per hour. So 60 divided by 20 equals three. So that means each nautical mile takes us three minutes. And then we simply multiply the, by the distance to the site, which was 13 miles. Three thirteens are 39. Now, when you set off and you want to go to this dive site with your GPS, and you've got your GPS up and running, and you've put the position of the dive site in correctly, I hope, otherwise you're not going to find it. And um, you've asked the GPS to take you to the site by pressing the go to button. Uh, when uh, you get the boat up and going and you're at your uh, uh, cruising speed it should be telling you that it's about 39 minutes to get to the site and if it's telling you it's any different to that 39 minutes then clearly you have a problem so a bit of mental arithmetic required here um, and it's a, a check against the fact that you've put the right information into your gps to take you to the right site and the nice thing about um, marine speeds is they all divide easily into 60 minutes. So if we take our typical marine speeds. So here's speed, four knots, five knots, six knots, 10 knots, 12 knots, 15 knots, 20 knots, 30 knots. We'll stop at 30 and you will just see 30. I think you can. So if you're doing four nautical miles per hour, then four into 60 goes 15 minutes. So the time for a mile is 15 minutes. Fives into 60, 12. Six into 60, 10. Tens into 60, six. Twelves into 60, five. Four, three, two. Um, now, even if you can't remember that, you could make a little table and you can have it on the dash of the boat if you so wish. And it's very easy. If we want to do 13 miles and we're doing 10 knots, each mile takes us six minutes, six times the distance, six tens is 60, six is 18, 78 minutes. And so a nice, simple little method of checking that you've actually put the right information into your GPS and uh, that your GPS is telling you uh, the time it's going to take you to the site. And of course, it also should say that it's 13 miles to the site. If it's saying anything other than 13 miles and 39 minutes, there is a problem. OK. So we'll need, we need to move on a little bit now. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation. So just stand by. So remember, a minute of latitude is a nautical mile. The size of that minute varies uh, against the general scale of the chart. Um, look very carefully at um, the scale on the side of the chart. Make certain you are using uh, a, a minute rather than anything else. And the smallest segment we have is a tenth of a nautical mile or a tenth of a minute. There's our two examples that we've just done. The first thing I got you to do was to, uh, or I did as an example, was to measure this distance between these two points here. And then I've just had you guys measure this distance here. Um, work out how long it was going to take you at the appropriate boat speed. OK, um, now the next thing we need to know is how to work out a position in latitude and long, longitude from the, uh, from the chart. And we, we need that information so that we can program our GPS to go to that particular spot. Or um, you know, if we're in trouble out on the water and we've got a diving incident taking place, one of the things that the Coast Guard are what, going to want to know is where we are. And giving them a position in latitude and longitude um, is one of the ways that we can do that. And I've chosen to use this compass rose down here in the bottom left-hand corner of your chart. So if you'd like to... Uh, find that particular compass rose and follow through the process and uh, we'll see what we can do. 
Now, the compass rays I've chosen is just uh, to one side of Diamond Reef. That's this green area here. Uh, Mick, open their mics again for me, please. Uh, green areas on a chart, what, what do they represent, please? And what does the green area on the chart represent? Drying out area. A drying out area. Thank you very much indeed, John Nellis and John Kelly. Excellent. So this area dries out. So at certain states of the tide, it's likely to be land. So not a good place to go in your boat. OK. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the centre of the compass rose uh, as uh, an example um, of taking a position from the chart in latitude and longitude. And the first thing you need to do is to extend that position to the latitude scale on the side of the chart and the longitude scale on the top of the chart. And then you need to read it off. Now, um, we always do the northing first, that's the latitude scale. So that's the first read off that we need to do. And we need to look at the side of the chart and find a degree line. And here is 45 degrees and 50 minutes. And remember, these are minutes of latitude. So if that's 45 degrees and 50 minutes, that must be 45 degrees, 49 minutes, 45 degrees, 48 minutes, 45 degrees, 47 minutes, 45 degrees, 46 minutes and 45 degrees, 45 minutes. And we're somewhere between 45 minutes and 46 minutes. Okay, um, so we are 45 degrees, 45 minutes, and then you can count the little segments, each of 0.2, 0.2, 0 0.4. So I make that position 45 degrees, 45 minutes, decimal four north of the equator. And then here's our scale that in this particular case goes across the centre of the chart, but it's the same scale as we have top and bottom of the charts, the longitude scale. And the longitude scale is how far east or west of Greenwich we are. Greenwich is the, the zero line that we start from. Uh, and on this particular scale, we're over six degrees west of Greenwich. So I'm going to tell you that because the six degrees doesn't appear on the scale. And there is the 34 minute line, 35 minute line, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, and so on and so forth. So I make us six degrees, 34, 35. I'm saying that, and I'm looking at my scale, that 34 might be a depth of water. So uh, let's go back along the scale just a little bit and check that we've done that right. Stand by. Ah, there we go. Look, there's the six degree and 15 minute line there. OK, so that's 16 minutes, 17 minutes, 18 minutes, 19 minutes. That's a red herring. That's a depth of water of 34 meters. So we are six degrees, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 minutes west from Greenwich. So let's see if that's right. There we are, 45 degrees, 45 minutes decimal four north, and zero zero six degrees, 19 minutes west. So, so easy to make a mistake like that. That looks as though that 34 is associated with that line. It's not at all. But there's the six degree and 15 minute line there. So the correct position of the center of our compass rows is 45 degrees, 45 minutes decimal four north, 006 degrees, 19 minutes west. And if we put that position into our GPS and ask it to go to that position by pressing the go to button, it will take us to that very, very spot. Now, unfortunately, we won't find a big purple circle printed on the sea because it's totally fictitious, but that is where we will be. Now, what I'd like you guys to do now, and I'm going to swap back to my chart. So here's my chart now. And I'm now interested in the bottom left hand corner, uh, bottom right hand corner of the chart. 
if we look right the way down in this bottom right hand corner of the chart, uh, this area here, and um, just in the middle of that area is a tidal diamond, and it's called tidal diamond Q. And what I'd like you guys to do is to run uh, lines from tidal diamond Q to the side and the bottom of the chart. There's our line going across to the side of the chart, the latitude scale. And here's our line coming down to the longitude scale. And I'd like you to try and work out for me the correct position of tidal diamond Q in latitude and longitude. And Mick, if you could open their mics uh, when uh, somebody's got an answer, if you'd like to come back to me and let me know what you think the answer is, please. The correct position in latitude and longitude. Are we taking it from the center of the diamond or you from the point? From the center of the diamond, indeed. Okay. And when you're transferring the position to the side of the chart, the bottom of the chart, um, make every effort to make certain that your line is straight and square um, so that you get the right position on the side of the chart. Could you get your camera a little bit closer to the chart and then I might be able to read yours because I haven't got a chart with me. Thanks. Ah, OK. Can I get my camera a little bit closer to I'll do my best for you. I may have to put the chart up so that you can see it like that. Will that help? So, that move it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. OK, no problem at all. So we've got 45 degrees, 40 points. Eight minutes. Okay. Five degrees, forty-two point four minutes. Okay. Hold that figure, and we'll see what anybody else has got. Okay, I guess um, forty-five degrees, forty minutes point three five knots, and six degrees, forty-two minutes point two. Well, that's somewhat different to Vivian's answer. Yeah, so I get forty-five degrees, forty point seven north. Okay. Five degrees, 42.4 west. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I get 45 degrees, 40 minutes, uh, 0.8 north. Five degrees, 42 minutes, 0.4 uh, uh, west. Yes. <clears throat> so yes. We're, we're all doing pretty well here, apart from the person that's got six degrees. Uh, yes, sorry, I was... Uh... Or following the previous one. Sorry about that. It's, uh, okay. Five, um, so those of you who've got a chart, if you now look at the top of your chart and find its tidal diamond Q in the tidal screen box, and here is tidal diamond Q in the tidal screen box. Let me try and get it up under the camera so you can all see it. Tidal diamond Q in the tidal screen box. And if you read what it says, it says 45 degrees, 40.7 north, and 5 degrees, 42.4 west. So those of you that got anything like that, give yourself a slap on the back and a tick. Well done. Okay. If you could turn their mics off again, that would be really great. So. If we can take a position from the chart in latitude and longitude and uh, get an accurate position, we can then transfer that position to our uh, chart plotter. Uh, and um, that will enable us to go to that particular spot. Or as I said earlier, if we're dealing with some sort of diving incident, uh, then um, when the case got asked where we are, uh, we can give them a, a, a readout in latitude and longitude. And we could take it from the chart or we could take it from the chart plotter and they will know where that is because on the wall at the back of the the case card ops room there's a huge chart that they'll go and put a, a sticker on and say well that's where they are and clearly um, that's where they're going to send the rescue services to you so positions of latitude and longitude really quite important okay so what have we got left to do well the last thing we need to do is to be able to work out a direction because when uh, we ask our uh, GPS to take us somewhere. Uh, one of the things that it, it gives us is the direction to the site. And we've got a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, we can uh, 
work off the chart to get our direction using the uh, compass rose that's on the chart. And you'll find that there are numerous compass roses dotted about the chart. Um, and we can use those to determine direction. So if we are uh, trying to work out the direction from here to here, that was the original distance that we measured between Cape uh, Bullshaw Lighthouse and the lighthouse on Gillimot Island. Uh, we could use this compass rose over on the side here to work that out. And if we're going to do that, we've got a fairly simple way of doing it. Those of us that are um, able to use a chart plotter, I'll come to in a moment or two, uh, but Going back to just our sheet of A4 paper, if we put the edge of our A4 paper between the two places, I've lined my edges up between the two places, and we maintain the angle that we have here, and we simply slide it down to the nearest compass rose. And there is a compass rose down at the bottom of my chart just here. You can just see the rings of the compass rose here. We slide down, maintaining that same angle until we go through the center of the compass rose. And here's our uh, piece of paper here going through the center of the compass rose just here. And where it crosses the side of the compass rose, we can read off the bearing. And I make it about 108 degrees true. So um, we would do that task normally with a set of parallel rules, but if you haven't got a set of parallel rules, a piece of paper will do it for you as long as you maintain the right angle as you slide down. Uh, the professional way of doing it, of course, is to use one of these chart plotters. And here, uh, if we want to go from Cape Borshaw to Guillemot Island, we need to orientate the chart plotter so that the arrow is pointing the direction we wish to go or the direction in which we are looking. We need to put the edge of the chart plotter along the uh, intended route. So take Borshaw to get a my island lighthouse. And then we've got a movable compass rose in the middle of the chart plotter. You can see it here. Uh, and we need to align that compass rose correctly to north at the top of the chart because Gerardus Mercator may be the top of the chart north. So here's our north arrow here. So that needs aligning to the top of the chart. And we've got some very convenient straight lines in the center here to line up on a straight line on the chart to ensure that north is correctly aligned. Let me just pick a straight line a moment. There we are. And then having done that, we can remove the chart plotter from the chart and we can move it around so that we can see uh, clearly the scale. We're going to read off against the zero scale. And I made it with my piece of paper 108 degrees. Uh, well, there's 105, 6, 7, I've got about 107. So those are your two uh, choices. Um, most people that are doing any sort of chart work at all will have one of these chart plotters. But if you haven't, you can substitute a piece of paper and it'll do the job just as well. So if you remember earlier on, we measured the distance between the gas platform here. Uh, Alpha Juliet Delta gas platform and St. Anthony's Head Lighthouse, and we made it about 13 miles. Well, let's say we want to go from St. Anthony's Head to the gas platform. Can you work out for me, guys, what direction we would steer the boat in as a true bearing using one of those two methods? And Mick, you can open the mics again so that they can give me an answer in a moment or two. I think 316. I've got somebody suggesting 316. I'd better do it on here so I know if that's right or not. So if I put my end down the line, so arrow pointing the direction I wish to go, a line north to the top. Yeah, 316 also. I've got several people saying 316. I have 316 also. So if you've got something like 316, you're going in the right direction. And of course, when you ask your GPS to take you to that site, it is going to give you the bearing that you need to steer to go to that site. And it should be exactly the same as you've taken from the chart. And if there's any major issue between the two, then there's clearly something wrong. And it's usually a program. So chart work is um, 
something that perhaps is a bit of a necessary evil, but it's nice to be able to understand a chart and to work from a chart. And in terms of the electronics that we tend to use on both these boats these days, um, taking information from the chart and comparing it to what the electronics are telling us is a good check to make certain that we've actually done it right. Because the last thing we want to do is not be able to find the site and end up with a dive uh, on flat sand when we were looking for a reef or a wreck or whatever it happens to be. And our GPS, when we press the go to button, is direction to the site as a bearing, distance to the site in nautical miles, if we've got it set in nautical miles. And once we set off from the boat in our boat's cruising speed, it will give us the time that it's going to take us to get to the site. And if any of those figures are not correct, uh, or there's a significant difference between what we've taken from the chart and uh, what the GPS is actually saying, um, then clearly we've made some sort of mistake. Okay, let me jump back to my PowerPoint presentation and we'll uh, just wind this up. So that was the last little exercise we did and we said it was uh, 316 uh, to steer from the lighthouse uh, here on St Angela's Head to the gas platform. And what we didn't mention, and I'm going to jump back to our compass rays for a moment, and there it is there. What we didn't mention was something called variation. And uh, variation is the difference between true and magnetic. I touched upon it in the last session. Uh, and I also said that it was probably a good idea to have your uh, GPS set in magnetic so that the bearing that it gave you uh, was a magnetic bearing and thus it complied with your magnetic compass and other instruments upon your boat. Uh, but don't forget that there is a uh, something called variation, which is the difference between true and magnetic, true being the, the top of the planet around which the planet rotates and magnetic being where our magnetic compass points. Uh, and if we're not working uh, in magnetic, um, or we want to convert from true to magnetic, we need to take that amount into, into account. And it's always written across the same. Okay, uh, so that was the second part of an introduction to charts. And my objectives were that by the end of the session, you would be able to measure a distance on a chart. I um, hope you can do that now. Use the latitude scale on the side of the chart, and a minute of latitude is a nautical mile. Smallest segment in a minute is a tenth of a minute, which is a tenth of a nautical mile, or 185 meters. Uh, established position by latitude and longitude. Well, clearly, you need to accurately transfer that position to the side of the charts and then read the information off uh, and make certain you get both your degrees, your minutes, and your tenths correct. Uh, and finally, understand to use the compass rose, and, and I've given you two options for that. I've shown you how to use the compass rose, it's printed upon the chart, and I've also shown you a chart plotter for a chart plotter that enables you to do the same task.